And if you would turn with me in your Bibles this morning to James chapter 3, we'll be looking at the first six verses of that chapter this morning as we have finished our summer psalm series and get back into James here where we left off earlier in the summer. Uh, James chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. And I also want to take this opportunity to recognize some guests. Uh, it's good to have Elizabeth McDaniel here today. I had the opportunity of meeting her son James in the Summer Bible Club, uh, so it's nice to have you here with us. And also, it's good to have uh, Leroy's uh, sister and brother-in-law here from North Carolina as well. It's good to see you guys back and hope you get an opportunity to see them all after service and visit them with them a little bit as well. So this morning, we're looking at James chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 6. And this morning, as we uh, started out our Sunday school, John asked me, where's that verse in the Bible that says about teachers will be held to a higher standard? Well, right here we are today. So a little bit of God's providence working in our service already, uh, for which we are thankful. So James chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Uh, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive <clears throat> the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. But if a man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven by fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. One beautiful September day, much like today, two frogs were hopping happily through the woods, going about their froggy business, when all of a sudden they fell into a deep pit. They began to croak for help, and eventually another group of frogs heard them and gathered around the pit to see what could be done to help their companions. Now, if you're wondering, this, like all my sermon illustrations, is a true story, just in case you were in doubt. When the frogs saw how deep the pit was, the rest of the dismayed group agreed that it was hopeless and told the two frogs in the pit that they should prepare themselves for their fate, because they were as good as dead. Unwilling to accept this terrible fate, the two frogs began to jump with all of their might. Some of the frogs shouted into the pit that it was hopeless, and the two frogs wouldn't be in that situation if they had been more careful, more obedient to the froggy rules, and more responsible. But other frogs continued sorrowfully to shout that they should save their energy, give up, since they were already as good as dead. The two frogs continued jumping as hard as they could, and after several hours, despite their efforts, were quite weary. Finally, one of the frogs took the heed of the calls of his fellows. Spent and disheartened, he quietly resolved himself to his fate, lay down at the bottom of the pit, and died as the others looked on with helpless grief. The other frog, however, continued to jump with every ounce of energy he had. Although his body was racked with pain, and he was completely exhausted. His companions began anew, yelling with more ardor for him to accept his fate, stop the pain, and just die. The weary frog jumped the harder and the harder at that point, and wonder of wonders finally leapt so high that he sprang from the pit. Amazed, the other frog celebrated his miraculous freedom, and then gathering around him asked, why did you continue jumping when you were told it was impossible? Reading their lips more clearly now, that he was closer to them, the astonished frog explained to them that he was deaf, and that when he saw their gestures and shouting, he thought they were cheering him on. What they had intended as discouragement, he had perceived as encouragement and inspired him against all odds to succeed. This simple story contains a very powerful lesson. It's summed up in what Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Certainly true, isn't it? What we say can make all the difference in the life of a person, in our life, in my life, and in your life. 
There's enormous power in our words. Our words are stronger than dynamite. Our words are stronger than nuclear fusion. Your words can kill and destroy. They can also bring life in love. That's what James wants us to know this morning, that your words are powerful. And you would better understand that. And he also tells you and me, we'd better be willing to take responsibility for our words as well. Again, as he says in verse 1, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For many things offend all, but if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Now the importance of our words is a theme that's very prominent throughout the book of James. He's already mentioned this in previous chapters, and here in chapter 3, it's virtually the dominant theme of this entire passage. But he doesn't begin immediately talking about the value of our words. He starts in an unexpected way. He says, my brethren, be not many masters. The connection really doesn't seem clear until we understand the flow of his argument at this point. What is James doing here? Is he discouraging men from entering the ministry because there's already too many? Well, not really. He's not discouraging them. But instead, he's actually encouraging ministers. He's encouraging pastors to consider the importance of their words. Consider the nature of their calling and what they do with it and consider the consequences of what they do with their words as well. Now, I may, oddly enough, be the only one in this room that this passage applies to directly, but I think we all can take something from it this morning. Last week, we talked about labor, and I ended up talking about how each and every one of us has a calling, something what God wants us to do. And each and every one of those callings requires a certain set of skills, right? A certain th set of things, gifts that you're able to do, things that you're able to be. And what is it for a pastor? Well, quite simply, the bread and butter of a pastor is simply his words. Preaching and teaching takes up the majority of his time, and the medium through, he preaches, through which he preaches and teaches are, of course, words. In our Sunday school class, we've been going through the importance of an office, uh, the, the office of a pastor. And we talked about the many words that describe a pastor and how those words describe the nature of that job and what he does. One of the things that the Bible calls a pastor is a bishop, which means that he's an overseer. He has to lead the church and establish a vision for the church. Pastors are also called elders or presbyters, which emphasizes the dignity and the qualifications of that office. Pastors are also elsewhere called in the New Testament, quite simply, pastors, which means shepherds. They're to care for the sheep with tenderness and also discipline. But we see here in this particular uh, passage that he uses the term masters or is often translated teachers, emphasizing the nature of a pastor's work. The majority of a pastor's work is in using words to teach and preach. It's the most important asset that a pastor has. A pastor can be many things. He has many and should have many assets in his calling, but the most important asset that a pastor had, has is not his sparkling personality, not his good looks, not his physical strength, not his mental acumen, or not even his managerial talent. Now, I realize that you guys may not realize that yourselves because you got the total package here, just <laughs> lucked out. But really, none of those things really matter that much. There's only really one thing that matters. That is his ability to preach and teach the Word of God with correct, with correct doctrine, with clarity, with consistency, and with conviction. If you have those things, you have the making of a minister. If you don't have those things, you don't have the making of a minister. What a pastor does with his words is largely... His work. Think about what Romans chapter 10 verse 14 says. And how then shall they call on him who they have not believed? And how shall they believe upon him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? It's kind of an overwhelming thought. What I do with my words has the possibility, the potential to either turn people on to the gospel and see them saved, see the direction of their soul change forever, yet also at the same time what I do with my words can turn people away from God, 
can turn them off from the gospel and in turn condemn their souls to a life of damnation. Great responsibility to think about. Great, great harm can be done from a pastor when he doesn't use his words with wisdom, either his words of doctrine or even his personal words of encouragement and shepherding. Not only in the pulpit, but in every single interaction. James tells us to weigh our words, for they're very, very important. Words have the power to shape how people understand themselves. They have the power to shape how they understand the universe. They have the power to shape how they understand sin, salvation, and God himself. It's not something to take lightly. I think about this every time I go down into preschool for our weekly lesson. I'm sure Joy and Carrie thinks about this as well when they teach young minds. You're presenting these facts to them for the very first time. Of course, when children are young, they're very impressionable. And what you say will largely determine how they see the world from that day forth. It's a great responsibility there, and we ought to take that responsibility with great seriousness. Our words will largely determine how people see the world. I kind of thought it was funny. Many of you may have seen it on the news this week where uh, the libertarian candidate, Gary Johnson, was asked, you know, what would you do about Aleppo? And his response is, what is Aleppo? Aleppo is a city in Syria where they have kind of some terrible attacks going on today. And uh, afterwards, they asked him, you know, are you for real? How can you not know what Aleppo is? And he said, I admit, it's totally irresponsible of me. If I'm going to be president, if I'm going to run for president, I have responsibility to know what I'm talking about and use my words with responsibility. That's true of every teacher, of every preacher. We have to use our words because there is responsibility that goes with our words. Society really doesn't understand that today. Think about how many arguments there are out there on Facebook, or how many people call in to the radio thinking they're the next expert on whatever is being talked about. Well, it's great to be able to spew forth your words on everything that you think is right and wrong without the world, but what's true is in those situations, there's no responsibility for those words. Are there? Is there? Not really. Not really. But you and I need to take serious our responsibility for our words, because great harm can be done through our words, or great good can be done through them as well. Many times your direction in life, the direction of others in your life around you will be determined by what you do with your words. Luke chapter 12, verse 48 says, For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall be much required. Or more succinctly, as Spider-Man says, with great power comes great responsibility, right? Now, this isn't limited to pastors, right? Each and every one of us use our words. We use our words to shape our view of ourselves, our other views, other people's views of us, and other people's views of God in the world around them. It's important for you and I to understand the responsibility of our words. James wants this to apply to everyone, not just pastors. Look what he says in verse 2. For in many ways, for in many things, we offend all. If, many, if any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Here James picks up on something that he mentioned back in chapter 2, uh, verse 18. He says, Yea, man may say that thou hast faith, and I have works, Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. What he's trying to get across to us is that your words must match what's in your heart. He told us before that your works must match your words, but now he tells us that your words must match your heart as well. Because he tells you the truth of the matter is, eventually they'll show everyone what's really in your heart. Eventually, you'll use your words enough that you find out what's in a person's heart, don't you? Your words will eventually show to yourself and to God and to everyone else what you're really thinking, what you really value, what you really worship. People can talk a good talk for a time, but if you're around them long enough, generally, you really get to understand who they are by what they say, how they say it, what they talk about, and who they talk about. Now, if you're a perfect person, 
The right things will always come out of your mouth, right? There's only one person that fits that qualification. It was Jesus Christ. It's kind of interesting. If you look throughout the New Testament, what were the Pharisees and scribes always trying to catch Jesus up in? Not his actions, but his words, right? They're always laying these traps to get him to say the wrong thing so they can condemn him. How many times did he fall into one of these traps? Not once. He always said the right things. because He always thought the right things. He had a good heart, and out of his heart spoke good words. Now, how often do you mess up in your words a little bit? Sometimes it doesn't really take uh, someone to lay a trap for us, right? Sometimes we really lay our own traps with our mouth. How many times do you send those words out of your mouth thinking before they even leave your lips, boy, I wish I could have those words back? How often do you almost say something and think, wow, would I almost really say that? Am I really thinking that? Ladies and gentlemen, it really reveals what's in our hearts because our words do just that. Luke chapter 6, verse 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's only a matter of time. That if you listen to a person's words, if you listen to your own words long enough, you'll see what's really in your heart. It's kind of interesting. When we had the concert this uh, past Wednesday, I got to talk to the Spencer family's kids a little bit, uh, 13 of them, right? And just talking to them was quite interesting. I think every single one of their sentences were started with a please and ended with a thank you, even when it kind of didn't even make any sense to say please and thank you, because that's what they were trained to say. They were trained to be courteous and kind, because it showed you by their words what was in their heart. They showed gracious, thankful words because they were brought up to be gracious, thankful people. Your words reveal what's in your heart. And sometimes we'd like to disconnect that. We'll say, oh, yeah, we said that, but we didn't really think that. We really didn't mean that. But you know what? The truth of the matter is we did because we said it. And actually, we thought it. We can't disconnect it. And God says your heart is clearly revealed by your words. It's true in every step of our Christian life. It's true immediately after we're saved. Think about what Romans 10 verses 9 through 11 says. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. What does Paul tell us there? He says we're saved by faith, right? There's nothing we do, nothing we say that brings about salvation to us. Christ died on the cross. He paid for our sins. He gives us his righteousness. And the moment we repent of our sins and believe upon him, we're saved. We need nothing else. But what does he tell us that we have to do immediately after we're saved? We have to confess with our mouths. We're Baptists here, so we believe that you ought to make a credible profession of faith before you're baptized. And when you're baptized, that's actually a public display to everyone as to what is in your heart, that you believed upon Jesus Christ. And that's an important thing for everyone to do, to make that confession upon salvation. So there's no doubt in your mind, and no doubt in anybody else's mind, where you stand with Jesus Christ. But what's unfortunate the people often make that testimony there when they're saved, but that's the last time they really testify to Christ with their mouth. Every word that comes out of your mouth after you're saved ought to testify to who is living in your heart. Ask yourselves, how many words did you speak this week? And how many of those words testified to Jesus Christ? How many of those words testified against him? Our words, we see, not only divulge our spiritual lives, but as we look at the next verse, it also directs our spiritual lives as well. And uh, James does so by showing us how this bridal metaphor is extended here a little bit. James chapter 3, verses 4 through, excuse me, 3 through 5. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may, may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which though they be great are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. 
Folks, if you're really not happy in the direction that your life is headed, do me a favor. Look at your words. Think about what you're saying about yourself, what you're saying about God. Think about what you're saying to others. Think about how you say it. Think about who you say it to. Think about when you say it. And think about what you don't say as well. Because your words really can shape your reality. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, which I started out with this morning, I only read half of it, and here's the second half. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. What you say largely determines the fruit that you'll reap in your life. What you use your words to say will often determine the direction that your life is going. Think about the examples that Paul or James gives us here. A ship with a rudder. Now, a ship that's just sitting there in calm water doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't need a rudder. And so often, uh, we think of our lives just like that, that we're really not going anywhere. Really, there are no consequences to our words. We're just kind of keeping everything right where they are. That's not the way life is. He says there are, in this passage, fierce winds about this ship. Ladies and gentlemen, there are forces in your life that want to drive you towards God or away from God. And you need to make a choice as to how you will set the rudder for your ship. And so often, how you set that direction will be determined by what words you use. What words you use to other people, what words you use to God, what words you use for yourself. And then he gives this other example of a horse. How only a fool would ride a horse without a bridle. Now sometimes I am a little foolish, I'll be honest. The horses are out in the pasture, you know, no halter, no bridle, no saddle, and sometimes I'll just kind of crawl on them to see what happens. And as long as they're eating grass, no problem, right? But eventually the horse is going to head off in a direction, and chances are it's not going to be the direction I want to, so I have to make a very quick dismount at that point. Ladies and gentlemen, the horse is going to go somewhere. Your life is eventually going to go somewhere, and there's no standing still in it. Where is it going to go? What direction are you going to point it to? And what direction do your words have your life on track to arrive to? You see, the Bible sees our words not just as neutral forces. They see them as creative forces. Edgar Allan Poe said, Words have no power to impress the mind without the exquisite horror of their reality. Words have a reality about them, and when you use them, they have consequences, and you can't get out of those consequences of what you say. Think about what Hebrews chapter 11 verse, thir- uh, verse 3 says. Through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made out of those things which do appear. How did God create everything you see today? Was it out of something that already existed? No. He spoke the universe into existence. He used words to create reality. Ladies and gentlemen, words have an extremely, inexorably huge ability to create a reality. Not only can they build up, but they can also destroy. Think about what happened in Genesis chapter 3, just a little bit after creation. Now the serpent was more subtle than any of the beasts of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden. And with those words, by using those words and by believing in those words, everything was destroyed and corrupted. You and I create reality with our words. Now let me clarify. I don't mean that you and I create reality ex nihilio, as the theologians say, out of nothing. No, we can't create anything just by making our words. And nor am I trying to be a prosperity gospel where you simply name it and claim it. I'm rich and famous, so I'm going to be rich and famous. I'm going to be good-looking and strong, so I'm going to be good-looking and strong. No, that's not what I'm talking about here. But there's a truth to that, that you and I create our reality with our words. What kind of reality are your words creating in your home? The words that you use with your children, what are you forming them into by those words? Those words that you use with your friends. What kind of relationship are you creating when you use those words? Your words that you use in this church. What kind of reality are you creating in when you use those words in this church? 
Think about that very seriously. You and I use words, and we use them to build realities in our churches, in our own hearts, and in our own homes. Let us be very careful when we pick out the words we use and the way we put them together. In the end, we put them together towards. Verse 6 here to end on, and I want to read this verse from uh, the American Standard Version rather than the authorized version here. James chapter 6 Excuse me, James chapter 3, verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. The world of iniquity among our members is the tongue, which defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the wheel of nature, and is set on fire by hell. You see, when you and I create reality with our words, they're not words that we came up with. They're not ideas that we have prov provided for ourselves. But instead, we're using a blueprint that's already been provided by us. We're using bricks of words to build sentences that were already provided by us. And you know what? There's two sets of bricks. There's two sets of blueprints which you have to choose from. One are God's words. You can use his words of love. You can use his words of grace. You can use his words of encouragement, of justice and mercy to build up according to the blueprint he has designed. Or you know what else is true? There's another blueprint out there with another set of bricks, another set of words that you can use to destroy and to build the kingdom of hell and Satan. It's kind of interesting. He uses the, the phraseology, to setteth on fire the wheel of nature that is set on fire by hell. The world is going somewhere, and the old saying is true. This world is going to a hell and a handbasket, right? And this whole world is set on fire by hell and Traveling down that road, reading this passage kind of reminded me of that Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire. I don't know if this was kind of the inspiration for that, but if you remember the video, it's a video where he sings this song, you know, We Didn't Start the Fire. It's always been burning as the world's been turning. And it shows all these tragic events that happen in the history of the world and over a certain period. And there's a truth to that. The tendency, uh, the track that our world is in is on the downhill. It's because of the influence of Satan. And so often when we use our words in an unbridled way, we're building according to his blueprint. Ladies and gentlemen, when you use words of lies, of criticism, of hypocrisy, when you use destructive words, you're using words from hell. What uh, word we find here in uh, this particular verse for hell is actually called Gehenna. If you're familiar with some of the geography of the Bible, you'll realize that this was the garbage dump outside of the city of Jerusalem. This is where they would throw all their garbage and kind of light it on fire. And even in one time in Israel's history, they would have human sacrifices here, pagan human sacrifices. And this is a picture of how we use our words. Folks, how many of your relationships have you sacrificed up to the idolatry of your own pride, of your own malice, of your own greed, by using words that were set on fire by hell. Something to think about. How many of your relationships have you burnt to the ground because you used the words that you wanted to use? You used the words that the devil tempted you to use rather than the words that God wants you to use. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning you and I have to realize there is great power in our words. And we have to realize that. And we have to take responsibility for the power of those words. And if you and I take responsibility for those words now, we can create a reality that is God-honoring, that's Bible-focused, that's focused on Christ. And I'll leave you with this warning. Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 through 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account whereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words... Thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. Your words that are perfectly true and perfectly righteous. Thank you that they instruct us, that they inform us, and that they warn us. Lord, help us to take these things to heart this morning. And realize that our words have great power. And to take that responsibility very seriously, because we can destroy relationships. We can destroy people. We can destroy people's hope by using the words that the devil tempts us to use. But also, help us to be encouraged by the sermon as well, because 
At the same time, words have a great potential. Words can build. Words can increase your kingdom. Words can increase love and grace. Help us to bridle our tongue, that we might not say the things that we want to say, but instead to say the things that you want us to say. Thank you for your truth, which always speaks to us, and which is always a guide to our souls, our bodies, and our tongues. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's conclude our service by singing hymn number 313, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Hymn number 313.